Okay, so thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming. Okay, so first thing I have is, is, is some historical perspective. Um, in 1971, the U.S. Office of Naval Medical Research issued a report listing various health effects produced by exposures to microwave frequency electromagnetic fields, which we usually abbreviate EMFs. And in that, they listed over 100 different effects produced by low-intensity non-thermal exposures. So these are exposures that are not produced by heating and are produced by low-level uh, EMFs that produce essentially no heating at all. And these included um, 40 different uh, what can be considered to be neuropsychiatric effects. So these include uh, changes in brain structure and function, changes in various types of psychological responses, and changes in behavior. It included eight different endocrine, that is hormonal effects, uh, including both uh, 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 amino acid-based uh, hormones and also steroid hormones. Um, it includes cardiac effects, which influence the electrical control of the heart, including changes in the ECGs, um, and uh, producing arrhythmias. And arrhythmias, as you may know, uh, are often associated with sudden cardiac death. So these can be very serious and, uh, and, and can be life-threatening. Uh, chromosome breaks and other changes in chromosome structure. Histological changes in the testis. So this is where you're looking at an animal testis where the animal's been exposed to these EMFs and where the structure, the cellular structure of the testis is changed in uh, substantial ways that you can examine under a microscope. Uh, cell death, what is now called apoptosis, a process important in uh, neurodegenerative diseases and also a number of other diseases. Uh, all of these things were going on and were documented in 1971, 45 years ago. And, uh, and the Naval uh, Report also provided approximately 2,000 citations, as 2,000 studies that have looked into one, one or more of these things, uh, that document the uh, various non-thermal health effects of these low-intensity uh, microwave frequency EMFs. So this was already known in the ancient past, and, uh, and, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, what is this thing doing? It's not going, oh, okay, here we go. So following that, there have been dozens of other reviews um, that have um, documented uh, non-thermal effects of various sorts, and there are thousands of primary literature citations, so primary, you know, primary literature meaning specific studies uh, that also document these reports that have come out since 1971. And, uh, and so among the effects that have been repeatedly documented since 1971, it include um, lowered male fertility, including lowered sperm quality and function, and also lowered female fertility. Female fertility has been less studied. It's much more difficult to study, but it has been studied, and, and it seems to be lowered fertility also seems to be going on in females. And there are also uh, reports of high levels of spontaneous abortion, after exposures. Okay, so some of these are animal studies, some of these are human studies. Um, oxidative stress has been reported in many, many, many studies following exposures. Um, cellular DNA damage has been reported, again, in many studies. Those include single-strand breaks in the cellular DNA, they include double-strand breaks in cellular DNA, and they also include 8-hydroxy deoxyguanosine, uh, that's that 8-OHDG in cellular DNA, and that can cause mutations of various sorts, okay? So, uh, uh, so cancer, which is likely to be, uh, to involve these DNA changes, but it's also been uh, shown recently that tumor promotion-like effects also occur in response to, uh, to uh, EMFs 
And so that's another, another aspect to this that seems to be involved in causing cancer. Um, there are widespread neuropsychiatric effects, including depression. I published a paper on that last year uh, that extensively documented this um, in response to a wide variety of different types of EMF uh, electromagnetic fields. So not just one kind of field, but many, many types of, of, of exposures. And uh, therapeutic effects. Uh, there are genuine therapeutic effects of these fields when they are at appropriate level and when they're focused on an appropriate part of the body. And those include uh, stimulation of bone growth, which is uh, the therapeutic effect that's been most studied, but there are also quite a number of others. Okay. Um, and uh, cataract formation had been, has been argued to be a thermal effect. In fact, the literature is very clear that it's not a thermal effect. It's caused um, by non-thermal effects, and in fact, it's going to be it's it's apparently caused by the mechanism that I will discuss uh, later on in this talk. Um, now, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, something again, it's been reported over and over and over again, and uh, and and um, so uh, melatonin depletion and sleep disruption, another thing that's been reported over and over and over again, and uh, so. So basically, all of these, you know, all these things have been reported in many, many studies, um, and and despite all the evidence for non-thermal effects, our current safety guidelines and standards are all based on the assumption that all, only thermal effects uh, need be of concern. So, um, in last year, in, uh, in 2015 there was an appeal to the United Nations and all the member states that was signed by 206 scientists from 40 different countries. The appeal stated that the current safety guidelines and standards are inadequate because they don't take into consideration non-thermal effects. The 206 scientist signers all had published peer-reviewed scientific papers on the biological effects of EMF. So these are not just ordinary people or ordinary scientists. These are all people and scientists who are deeply engaged in this area of science. And all of them say that the safety guidelines and standards are inadequate and that there are um, non-thermal effects of these fields. And, and uh, so I think that, um, and uh, let me just, oh, then the scientists who signed these collectively have published uh, over 2,000 such papers. Okay, so there's a, there's a, a, a large body of science which supports these views. And, uh, and so there should be no question that there is an international scientific consensus on the existence of non-thermal health effects and the inadequacy of the safety guidelines and standards. Okay? Now, um, so, how does all this work? How do these non-thermal effects get produced in our bodies? And I stumbled onto the answer that explains most of them in uh, 2012, and I've subsequently published five papers documenting the mechanism that I think is the central mechanism that's involved. And uh, these papers are listed here. Uh, this is a 2013 paper, the first of them, uh, this was honored by being placed on the Global Medical uh, Discovery website as one of the top uh, medical papers of 2013. Um, and it's been highly cited already, so it, there, there's a substantial amount of interest in it in the scientific community. Uh, here's another one that was focused strictly on the therapeutic effects. Um, Here's a, um, uh, another paper which has actually a lot of different things, which you can kind of tell from the long title, and, uh, and I'll talk about some of the implications of this paper uh, later on. And, uh, and then I, I published this paper on the, uh, the uh, uh, production of uh, widespread neuropsychiatric effects. I mentioned that before. Um, and... Uh, and then finally, there's a paper here that's aimed at industry, basically giving my scholarly advice about what industry should be doing. There's not sufficient space on the screen. 
Well, I think actually this thing is cut off. Okay. So it's my fault, not not the uh, not the not the screen problem. Okay. So uh, I think so. Yeah. Um, so how are non-thermal effects produced? There are 26 different studies that have shown that non-thermal effects of microwave and also lower frequency EMFs can be blocked or greatly lowered by using calcium channel blockers. So we have 26 different studies that show that non-thermal effects of microwave and lower frequency EMFs can be blocked or greatly lowered by calcium channel blockers. These are drugs that are specific for blocking what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. And we abbreviate these VGCCs. And um, among, there, there are five different types of calcium channel blockers with different structures that bind to different sites. And the only thing that we know of, and these are all thought to be highly specific, that they do is they all block or, uh, the calcium channel, the VGCCs. So, um, so they, they're blocking these channels. And what that tells you is that EMFs act by activating the VGCCs and allowing calcium ions to flow into the cell um, such that most, if not all, the biological effects are produced by the excessive calcium in the cell, okay? So everything seems to be going through these VGCCs, or at least most things, let's put it that way, and, um, and, and you can therefore block them with these calcium channel blockers. And uh, a lot of these uh, studies have been done in cell culture. Um, and of course, one of the problems with using these in, in the human body is that when you use high doses of them, they have many different side effects that because these channels, of course, have important functions in our bodies. So it's not clear that these are going to be useful in terms of preventing these things in real live human beings, but they certainly do prevent these things in cells and culture and, and also in animal studies. You can show that that's true as well. So um, now, um, let's see. Um, all right, now... now uh, now, they not, it's not only the microwave frequency EMFs that produce this VGCC <laughs> activation. It's also the extremely low frequency fields from our power wiring. And, uh, and uh, so 50 hertz, 60 hertz um, EMFs also do this. And, uh, and so, uh, but, you know, the, the main concern is with the microwave frequency things because, of course, our exposures are skyrocketing in this. They just keep going up and up and up with absolutely no sense that we're damaging our bodies. Um, that, uh, that doesn't mean that there are not effects from our power wiring. In fact, I'm sure there are that have health effects as well. But at least our exposures to those are not, are not skyrocketing at this point. So, um, okay, so... Um, now, there are five different additional types of evidence that each provide further support for this VGCC mechanism of action for the non-thermal EMF effects. Uh, and, and we only really have time to talk about one of these, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the most important of them um, because, you know, we have limited time here. So, um, the VGCCs and also there are some other voltage-gated ion channels. Um, so these are regulated in the normal physiology in our body by the charge across the plasma membrane, okay? Uh, so, that, you know, that's a normal physiological regulation that regulates the opening and closing of these channels. And so, um, and there's a structure in them that detects those electrical changes across the plasma membrane, and it's called the voltage sensor, okay? And, uh, and so what I'm going to argue is that the voltage sensor, because of its structure and it, because of its location in the plasma membrane, uh, is extraordinarily sensitive to these electrical effects. And, that's, and I'm going to argue that that's the reason why the voltage sensor is the primary and possibly the sole target of these low-intensity EMFs. And... Uh, 
Now, industry acknowledges something that's been known basically since, since the time of World War II, and that is that microwave and lower frequency EMFs can put forces on charged groups. So if you have a, a positively charged uh, molecule or a part of a molecule in your body, uh, either positive or negative, um, these uh, EMFs can put forces on that. They can push it or pull it uh, back and forth. And, um, and so th this, as I say, this has been known since the end of World War II. And it's also been known that this is the way microwave ovens cook your food, okay? So basically what you're doing is you're joggling charged groups around in your food at very high rates, and that heats the food, and that's what cooks it, okay? That's the way microwave ovens work. Um, now, so um, now what, what, what industry argues is, yeah, that's true. We know that's true, but um, the forces of these very low intensity fields are too weak to do anything. That's the central argument which they make. And it's a substantive argument, okay? But as I'm going to show you, it's wrong. And uh, so, uh, why? Um, so they argue that, that these, e these uh, low intensity EMFs are too low to produce any biological effects because they're too weak to put uh, high enough forces on these charged groups. Okay, now, um, now this is a structure of the of of the voltage sensor, and if you look at these um, at these cylinders in the slide, each of those cylinders is an alpha helix, which is uh, more or less going through the the plasma membrane. Okay, so these are all in the plasma membrane, the outer membrane of the cell, and uh, and. Uh, if you look at these, uh, you can see uh, on the top, you can see Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, and 4. You see those? And uh, those are called domains. They're very similar structures, and you can see the similarities just by looking at the picture here, okay? So they have, they have, this, they, they have four domains, and the fourth helix, the orange one there, in each of these domains, has a bunch of pluses on it. Those are all positive charges, okay? Those are all positively charged amino acids uh, side chains. And, uh, and so there, there, there are five on each of these uh, with a total of 20 positive charges. Those four orange helices, those, uh, five, those 20 positive charges are the voltage sensor, okay? Those are the structures that detect electrical changes here, okay? Now, I, let me just say, this, this was taken from uh, uh, Professor Anna Dolphin's uh, paper in uh, Nature Review's Neuroscience. Uh, she's a professor in the UK. And uh, now, um, there are a couple of things about this. This model was, uh, came out about uh, almost 10 years ago, well, almost 10 years ago now. Um, there are some things that have now been shown to be a little bit different now including the fact that, uh, that some of these alpha helices, instead of going straight up and down, are actually at an angle. And those include that orange cylinder that we talked about. It's in an angle. All of those charges, every single one of them, is, uh, is within the, what's called the lipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, okay? In the, in the kind of fatty section of the, of the plasma membrane. And the forces on those charges are much, much higher than you would expect for two different reasons, both of which come straight out of the physics, okay? So we're just talking about basic physics here. Um, the one thing is that it's been known uh, for, uh, oh, what is it, since the 1780s, I guess, uh, there was something called Coulomb's Law uh, that was, uh, that was uh, discussed by Coulomb, obviously. Um, and what, one of the things that Coulomb's law says is the forces on charged groups is inversely proportional to what's called the dielectric constant of the medium in which they occur, okay? Now, the dielectric constant of the lipid bilayer is about 1 120th of the dielectric constant of the aqueous phase, the water and salts that are found elsewhere in the cell, okay? 
So what that means is that the forces on those charges goes up by a factor of 120 because of that fact alone. And there's another fact which also makes it go up even further. The plasma membrane has a very high electrical resistance. And so electrical effects tend to be highly concentrated across the plasma membrane. They're about 3,000 times concentrated right across the plasma membrane because of that. And uh, that was estimated by, uh, by uh, Shepard et al. in a paper that was published in 2008, a paper in which they claim supported the idea that there couldn't be biological effects of these fields, okay? So their position is the opposite of mine, but I'm using some information that they, that they developed in that paper, okay? Now, um, so there's about a 3,000-fold, okay, so, so, so in total then... One question. Yeah? In the body exactly in line as it was on the picture? No. No, okay, uh, let's go back. Um, no, actually, this thing is wrapped around into sort of a cylinder, okay? So it's not flat. It's wrapped around, and, and, uh, and when those positive charges are pulled on, uh, basically the, uh, the, the, the channel that opens up is in the middle of all of them. So they're, they're kind of wrapped around, and in the middle you open up a channel by pulling on those positive charges, and then, and that's what opens the channel, okay? It's a kind of vortex? Uh, uh, I don't know, no, I don't think so. Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's roughly, you know, I mean, the point is that these, these four domains kind of go around in a circle. No, 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 but no, they're, they're, they're in the membrane, so they're, they're, uh, they just come out in this, out of that dimension and circle around. That's, that's the way they work, okay? So, uh, okay, so, okay, so, so the estimate then is that compared with for single forces, singly charged groups elsewhere in the cell, and those are essentially all in the aqueous phase, okay, so they're all in the water, um, the force on the voltage sensor is 20 times, okay, so the 20 represents the fact there are 20 charges, uh, times 120, that's the dielectric constant effect, times 3,000, that's the effect of the uh, high resistance of the plasma membrane. So they're uh, approximately 7.2 million times stronger than singly charged groups elsewhere in the cell. All right. So basically what that means is that the calculations of, 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 of industry claiming these things are that these uh, low intensity fields are not strong enough to do anything are off by a factor of something like 7.2 million. And um, you now th these are approximations, okay? These are not precise figures. I want to emphasize that. But they give you a, a, a good idea of how far off these things are um, from, you know, their calculations are from reality. And um, now, the, the same sort of reasoning then goes for the safety guidelines and standards. The safety guidelines and standards are based on heating. Heating is produced by forces on these singly charged groups elsewhere in the cell that, that then when you joggle them around, they, they heat things. We've already said that. And so this, this uh, to estimate um, the safety uh, based on heating, means that these uh, safety guidelines are off by a factor of something like 7.2 million as well, okay? So uh, it's been on the basis, on this basis, that the vast majority of the human population on Earth is being exposed to these EMFs uh, with, uh, with claims that uh, people don't have to worry about the safety, okay? Uh, believe it or not. Okay, so... How does this whole thing work? And uh, um, so uh, here's a, okay. So so here we have on the left the microwave uh, and lower frequency EMFs uh, activating the VGCCs and opening up a channel and increasing the level of intracellular calcium. So this is the calcium in the cell uh, that you know, and it's produced, of course, by a flow of calcium through the VGCCs into the cell, into the cytoplasm of the cell. 
And, uh, and so that's designated CA2 plus I. That, that, that refers to intracellular calcium. And uh, one of the things that happens as a consequence of that is that you, uh, you get a big increase in nitric oxide, NO. That's what that NO is, is nitric oxide. That happens because two of the enzymes that make nitric oxide are calcium dependent. So they have very low activity under normal circumstances, but when you have a lot of calcium in the cell, the activity goes way up and, uh, and, and you get a lot of nitric oxide. Um, there was an interesting uh, study that was published by uh, Arthur Pilla um, who uh, showed that you can take cells in culture, uh, you can expose them to a pulsed microwave field, and in less than five seconds you get a big, a big amount of nitric oxide produced. So all of that occurs extremely rapidly. Uh, and uh, now, the nitric oxide acts along that pathway to produce cyclic GMP, and, uh, and, the, uh, and that stimulates in turn a protein kinase known as the G kinase or protein kinase G. Uh, and that, though, that produces the therapeutic effects, okay? So this is what I said in my first paper on this. This is what Arthur Pella, who's a real expert on this, has said in another paper that was published at almost exactly the same time, that that pathway, the nitric oxide signaling pathway, is the main, possibly the sole pathway for producing therapeutic effects. Okay, so we know, or at least think we know, that we understand how, how the therapeutic effects work. Um, however, um, uh, when, when you get uh, um, in, uh, big increases in, 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 in uh, intracellular calcium, you not only get uh, big increases in nitric oxide, you also get uh, big increases in superoxide. Um, and that, I think you, there's a blue arrow there. I'm not sure you can see it. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, and, and those two react with each other to form proxynitrite, which is a potent oxidant. And proxynitrite, as you can see down along the, um, a little lower down, uh, can uh, break down to form free radicals and produce oxidative and nitrosative stress. We think that the proxynitrite, the free radicals, and the oxidative nitrosative stress all contribute to the pathophysiology, to the disease-causing effects of these EMFs. And, uh, and, and, and I also think that um, the intracellular calcium contributes as well by uh, producing excessive calcium signaling. So calcium signaling is a very important process in the cell. Normally it occurs only for very brief times. And, uh, and, uh, and then it's, you know, it's turned off, so you, know, you let calcium in the cell just for a little while and then you chuck it out. And, uh, but when you have excessive calcium signaling, that can also produce uh, many different pathophysiological effects at all. So basically, those are the mechanisms which I think cause the, uh, the uh, you know, all or almost all the problems that we see in this. Now, let me just say, I'm going to show you on the next slide something that involves the DNA damage. We talked about the fact you can get uh, single-strand breaks in cellular DNA, and those are thought to be produced by the free radicals. We know those free radicals can attack the DNA and, cause, and produce single-strand breaks. Okay, and so uh, this is a study of this uh, process, and... Uh, this thing has been called a comet assay. Well, you can't see this well at all. Can we turn the lights down a little bit? Maybe we can... Uh, uh, I can't see it, and I assume you can't see it. <laughs> Let's turn it. That's fine. Let's just leave it at that for now. I can go off of here. Okay, we'll turn it back on a little bit. Um, now, if you look at these... Just turn it off. Just turn it off. Uh, off. There you go. Okay. Okay. We can turn it on a little later. Okay. So, so what? Uh, okay. So let me just say, this came from a, uh, a study 
that was pub published by Lutz and Edelkoffer here in Germany and uh, entitled Objections Against Current Limits for Microwave Radiation and all those safety standards. We've been complaining about those for many years, many of us have. And, uh, and basically uh, what this was was a study where they were studying these single strand breaks uh, produced by um, a, a, uh, an exposure to 1800 megahertz um, this is a continuous wave exposure. I don't know if you can read that, but it says it's a continuous wave over here. And uh, so um, that's more or less the equivalent of, a, of using a, a mobile phone or a cell phone um, and for 24 hours. Okay, well, we don't usually use mobile phones for 24 hours, but we sometimes use them for several hours. Um, and this produces single strand breaks uh, fairly close to what happens with ionizing radiation, the equivalent of 1,600 X, uh, chest X-rays. So this is an extremely powerful um, ionizing radiation exposure. It is the equivalent of a, of, of a more or less equivalent of a cell phone usage. Okay. Um, well, okay. So I'm going to explain that. Um, so basically, what? Okay. So so what's happening here is the following. You you you, you treat the cells with various things, and then you have a sham exposure, which is basically no treatment. And, and then you take, uh, you take the, uh, the cells and you put them in a particular region here. That's where that circle is. Um, and, 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 and you put alkali in there. And what the alkali does is it causes the DNA, the DNA is normally double-stranded. It, 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 it allows the DNA now to, to become single-stranded for the, for the two strands to separate from each other. And if you have a lot of breaks, what are you going to have? You're going to have small pieces of DNA. And the small pieces of DNA are small enough that they can actually migrate away from that, uh, from that center. And so if you put these in an electric field, and the DNA is negatively charged because of the phosphates on it, uh, they will move to the positive pole. So the positive pole here is on the right. And what do you see? You see the DNA is moving off in that direction for the gamma radiation for uh, something that's sort of similar to mobile phone use, and, but not in the sham. Okay. Now, the other thing which is done here is you use a fluorescent dye which binds to the DNA and only fluoresces when it binds to the DNA. So you can visualize where the DNA is. Okay. Now, um, and so that's basically, that's this is what's called a comet assay because it looks at least superficially like a comet in the sky. It has its tail, okay? The tail or the single strand breaks, the DNA that's been broken, okay? So roughly speaking, what this shows is that um, the, uh, uh, the uh, mobile phone exposure uh, can produce single strand breaks that are of similar uh, to a similar amount to what 1600 X, chest x-rays produce. So here you have a comparison between a mobile phone has a little battery produces a very weak field compared with uh, with, uh, with x-rays, x-ray machine, very powerful, uh, you know, high, high, uh, high powered uh, machine and they produce similar numbers of single strand breaks based on this kind of criterion. Um, now, let me just say, this study actually underestimates the effect of the cell phones. Now, why is that? It's because uh, it's been known for a long time that pulse fields are much more active than non-pulse fields in biological effects. And, uh, and, and of course, all the, all the uh, wireless communications communicate via pulsations, okay? So they have pulsations, you know, up and down all the time. And, uh, and so, in a further study that was published later, and I just have the title on it here, but you can pull out the, uh, the, whole, the whole study out of the PubMed database if, you, if you'd like. And uh, that was done also by, the, by Adelkoffer and also by uh, Rudinger, one of his, uh, one of his uh, uh, colleagues in, uh, in Austria, and, and several of their, of their uh, uh, co-workers, and what that showed is that, in fact, uh, 
the continuous wave exposure produces uh, considerably less in the way of single strand breaks in the DNA than a real cell phone does at the same intensity. Okay? So this thing that we see here actually underestimates, considerably underestimates the activity of the cell phones. So, um, so you know, this, this is uh, actually, well, let's just leave light off for a minute here. Yeah. Yeah, let's leave it off for a minute and then we can turn it back on. Um, I, I just, what I want to say here is that, so the question is, how can a cell phone, a very low energy cell phone, how can a low energy photon, uh, sorry, a cell phone produce, uh, you know, these huge numbers of single strand breaks in the DNA uh, compared with much, much higher energy uh, x-ray machine? That's, that's the central question I'm raising here. And I think the answer, the probable answer is that there, there are actually three levels at which you get a high level of amplification between the VGCC activation and the production of the free radicals that produce the breaks here. Okay, so first of all, when the VGCCs are activated, they open up a channel, and you get about a million calcium ions flowing in the cell per second. So you get a huge amplification because there's so many calcium ions that flow in through each of these channels. That's number one. Number two is when you get your, you, you get your uh, intracellular calcium, uh, it has uh, basically catalytic effects on both the nitric oxide and the superoxide production. Okay, so you have another level of amplification. And then uh, when, when those two react to form peroxy nitrite, uh, the rate of the reaction is the product of the two concentrations. So it's NO times the superoxide concentration. And, and so you get another, a third level of amplification. You have three levels of amplification here. Okay, let's turn the lights back on. And so, okay, good, thank you. Now, when, hmm? A little bit higher, can you get a little bit higher? Lower? Oh, lower. I'm sorry, no, not that. <laughs> All right. Okay, is that good? Yeah. All right. Okay, so, so let's, okay, so, so um, now, when ionizing radiation produces these free radicals, it also has an amplification, but it's only at one level. So when ionizing radiation, you have these, you have these very high energy photons that go through a medium, go through the cells of your body, going through wherever they're going. They start knocking electrons out of molecules as they go along. And so you get a chain of free radicals produced uh, uh, along each of these. And so that chain basically is, is, a, is a considerable amplification mechanism. Um, that mechanism, by the way, was, was discovered by Arthur Compton, um, uh, and who got the Nobel Prize for this. This is called Compton scattering. You're basically scattering free radicals behind these, these uh, high energy uh, uh, photons. And, uh, and so, so there, is, there is amplification there, but it's only at one level. I think that you have, to be able, you have to explain this in terms of the difference in the amplification. And so, in fact, what seems clear from this is that there is a strong argument that, uh, that these microwave frequency EMFs, in fact, are more dangerous than ionizing radiation um, to the body. This, of course, is exactly the opposite of what industry has been claiming uh, for many, many years. Okay, so um, now uh, I have in this table um, a, a discussion of how these various things that I talked about before that have been generated by these um, low intensity EMFs can be produced by that mechanism that we just discussed before. And I don't really have time to go through these, but sim I simply want to state that with one exception that I'll point out as I go along, all of these can be produced through those mechanisms that I discussed, you know, in that, in that, you know, the, in the pathophysiology and the, and the therapy, okay? Um, so, and that includes oxidative stress, it includes single strand breaks in the DNA, double strand breaks in the DNA, 8-hydroxy deoxyguanosine in the DNA, cancer 
in which uh, a number of mechanisms are probably involved. Um, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, male and female infertility, the therapeutic effects that we discussed before, uh, the widespread neuropsychiatric effects, uh, melatonin depletion, sleep disruption, cataract um, formation, the changes in the heart, which include tachycardia, bradycardia. Tachycardia is fast heartbeat, bradycardia is slow heartbeat, arrhythmia. Um, and sometimes, sometimes the, the, these may lead to sudden cardiac death. There are also heart palpitations that can be produced as well by these fields. And uh, the, um, the hormone, in, the, the endocrine effects can be produced. Um, and uh, let me just say, uh, many of the hormones in the body and all of the neurotransmitters in the body are released through the action of VGCCs and intracellular calcium, okay? So, so this mechanism is very closely linked to uh, the release of many hormones and the release of neurotransmitters throughout the nervous system. Steroid hormones are not, are not released that way, but their synthesis can be affected. And this is the one thing that is, is different from what I showed you in that diagram. Uh, I think this is a direct nitric oxide effect on, the, uh, on some of the enzymes that are involved in the synthesis of the steroid hormones. And apoptosis can be produced also by these effects. So, so program cell death. So all these things can be produced essentially in this way with the one exception that I said before. The steroid hormone effects are, are probably direct effects of nitric oxide acting on, 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 on certain enzymes. Um, the, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I mean, now this doesn't prove that all these mechanisms are in fact what's going on, although in some cases we have substantial evidence that suggests that these are right. Um, but uh, what it does prove is that when industry supporters claim there are no possible mechanisms, that they're wrong, okay? And that's, that's I think, very clear. Um, and they do, they do make those claims, as you probably know. So, okay. Um, now, these are not the only pathophysiological effects of these EMFs, uh, but they are among the best understood in terms of mechanisms, and they're also among the best documented in terms of occurrence. Uh, and they give you some idea of the breadth of the effects that are seen. Um, and they document how these, uh, these microwave frequency EMFs attack each of the four things we most value as individuals and as a species. Uh, that they attack our health in multiple ways. They attack our brain function. And let me just say something I haven't mentioned, I don't think, and that is in the animal, the, some of the early animal studies, it was shown that, um, that these uh, non-thermal microwave frequency EMS have absolutely massive effects on the structure of animal brains. Uh, some of these studies going back all the way to the 1950s. Um, they attack the integrity of our genomes, and they attack our ability to produce healthy offspring. Um, now that, in and of itself, I think is quite stunning, uh, and I'm going to talk about some other things that they do subsequently, okay? So, uh, but, you know, when you think about that, it's, it's really quite stunning that all of this stuff is going on and nobody's doing anything about it. Um, or almost <laughs> nobody, anyway. Now, let, I, I want to talk a bit about electromagnetic hypersensitivity. I know that some of you are, are quite interested in it. And uh, so, cases of EHS are thought to be caused by previous exposures to EMFs, uh, particularly microwave and radio frequency EMFs, but also, in a number of cases, other kinds of EMFs. Um, and one of the main sources of information about possible mechanisms of EHS uh, may be based on what we know about the mechanism of multiple chemical sensitivity, MCS. Uh, these, these two have a number of things in common. And so, and I think we know a lot more about MCS than we do about EHS. And again, we have, you know, we have certain groups that claim to the contrary, but I think the evidence is quite clear on that. And um, 
So, so first of all, cases of each of them can be initiated by previous exposures, most commonly chemicals in the case of MCS and EMFs in the case of EHS. Uh, secondly, such exposures cause high-level sensitivity responses, or at least multiple exposures may be necessary or, or, or perhaps not, depending on the individual case. Um, MCS and EHS are often comorbid, that is, they often occur together in the same individuals, and they both involve symptoms coming from the brain and symptoms coming from the peripheral tissues, okay? So, so, so there are different regions of the body that may produce sensitivity responses in each of them. So a lot of them involve the brain, but, but then there are a fair number that do not. Um, so uh, anyway, there, there, there's another thing I think that they have in common. There is a lot of variation in the symptoms from one individual to another, both MCS and an EHS. So, when, and, and I believe that this is because there are different tissues that are impacted in different individuals. They're not all the same. And, uh, and, uh, and, and for that reason, you see, you see different sensitivity responses in both MCS and EHS uh, from one individual to another. So, so they are heterogeneous in this way. Um, that shouldn't be surprising, and, uh, but it's something that needs to be recognized because otherwise you, you get these weird responses where people say, oh, they're all different from each other, that can't be true, which of course is totally illogical. But um, so, okay, so we have now, um, now in, in MCS, and I used to work on this uh, quite a bit, um, there are seven classes of chemicals that are implicated in causing MCS, and uh, each of them work along different pathways, but they end up uh, activating these uh, NMDA receptors, okay? So uh, the, the uh, and when you activate the NMDA receptors, what happens? You open up a channel and you allow calcium to flow into the cell, okay? And the effects, most of the effects of the NMDA activation and most of the effects of the VGCC activation go through this excessive calcium in the cell. So, th so even though they're different, you have different targets initially, you have very similar effects. And so I think one of the, one of the sort of take-home lessons here is that sensitivity responses uh, can be produced by excessive calcium in the cell, okay? Now, how does it work? Um, and I, I, well, I guess I don't really, um, I guess I've already gone through most of this, so maybe we can skip this slide. Um, so, the, uh, so we have these similarities, and, and the question is, um, you know, what, how, 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 in fact, does this play out in terms of mechanism? Um, and so uh, one of the things that can happen in, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, no, I guess I, I didn't. Can I just ask something? <coughs> you had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You take up the L-type uh, channels here? Yeah. Does that mean that you've been talking about the L-types only for... No, and that's a good question. The L-type channels. Um, there, there are several. There are a number of types of of, of, of voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, the L-type ones are the ones that stay open the longest, and so they they are the ones that can most easily produce kind of massive changes in intracellular calcium. Uh, and so, in that sense, they're more similar to the VGCCs. But there are other uh, voltage-gated, uh, sorry, there are other, uh, there are other, yeah, voltage-gated calcium channels, and they have different properties, and we really don't have time to talk about what the differences are. Yeah, but you've been talking about all of them. I've been talking about all of them, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're all involved in this, uh, with one possible group being an exception because nobody's ever looked at it, okay? Every, everyone that's been looked at is involved here, uh, is activated by these, uh, by these EMFs, okay? All right, so, um, and, and, and so that's a good question, and thank you for it. Um, 
so some of the things that, uh, that I think are going on here, and, and this is um, shown here in number six, is that, um, is, that the, is that the calcium from both the NMDA receptors and from the L-type BGCCs can produce, can stimulate what's called long-term potentiation. This is a mechanism which makes the synapses in the brain much more sensitive. So it makes them able to transmit information much more easily, okay? And so this is a sensitivity response immediately, okay? Now, this, this process is known to be involved in learning and memory, okay? So it's a normal process, but obviously when you have excessive amounts of it, it can cause problems. And, uh, and that's probably what's going on to some extent in both uh, of these. And I've also argued that, uh, as some of you know from my talk yesterday, that the, uh, the, uh, what we call the no-no cycle can be triggered by these uh, changes, by uh, calcium, by nitric oxide, peroxynitrite, superoxide, they all have roles in, uh, in, in um, uh, initiating the, uh, what we call the no-no cycle which is a, a local cycle that can impact the cells in different parts of the body. So uh, I think those are involved. And I think there's something else involved, and or some other things involved, and I want to just say a, little, a, a few words about that. Um, but before getting into that, I want to say something about uh, two of the observations which lead me to say that I think that EHS is a real sensitivity. Okay, um, one is that EHS people on exposure often develop neuropsychiatric symptoms similar to those caused by EMF exposures in the general population, just at lower intensities. So this suggests, yeah, we all respond to these things with these kinds of problems, but the EHS people are more sensitive. So that this suggests this is a real sensitivity. It's, that's also true of the cardiac effects. Cardiac effects in EHS, at least some EHS people, uh, respond to these cardiac, you know, the, the kinds of tachycardia and, and arrhythmias uh, can be produced by very, very low exposures. And, uh, and that's been shown um, uh, in, uh, in some of Magda Havis' studies. And so, um, again, all patients are not the same. Everybody with EHS is not the same. Some people show these cardiac effects, some people don't. Um, now, there, there's another thing here that I, I, uh, I've been in email contact with Dr. Cornelia waldman selsam in Germany um, over, over the, the two weeks or so before I left the U.S. She has some very interesting observations about a particular EHS patient, and she's given me permission to talk about them, okay? But these are her observations, and I want to make sure you, you understand that. Um, and uh, so she has a patient uh, she calls S, uh, a woman who um, has la lost her parathyroid function due to an accident. Okay, so parathyroid, the parathyroid hormone uh, is, is a hormone which helps control extracellular calcium, the calcium levels in your blood, and, you know, that, that your cells are all bathed in, okay? That, th those extracellular calcium levels are are generally highly regulated. And because this woman lacks parathyroid function, she lacks the normal control of extracellular calcium, okay? And, uh, and, and what happens is, and, and this woman is extremely sensitive to, uh, to low levels of EMF exposure, and when she is exposed to these low levels, her extracellular calcium levels drop dramatically and rapidly, okay? And I think what this is telling us is that the VGCCs in this uh, sensitive person are highly sensitive themselves. So we're not just talking about downstream effects of the VGCCs being sensitive. We're talking about the actual VGCCs being highly sensitive. So they apparently are regulated in such a way in the EHS people that they are very sensitive to these fields. And, uh, and there are a number of regulatory mechanisms that we know can work on them. 
and, um, and such that uh, when this woman is exposed, these extremely low exposures, uh, you know, the, the uh, calcium flows into the cell, and as a consequence of that, the extracellular calcium really drops dramatically, okay? So this is a huge effect, and, and, and I think it shows us now that EHS involves sensitivity of the VGCCs and probably also sensitivity of some of the downstream effects to the VGCCs. And so it may be a combination of those two that leads to some of these extremely high levels of sensitivity that we see, okay, in some patients, not in all. Okay, so I think this is a very important observation that tells us a lot about what's going on in this patient and suggests that similar things are going on in other individuals, except that they control their extracellular calcium much better than, 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 this, than this person does because she lacks the parathyroid hormone. Okay? So, um, all right, so, so uh, you know, so that again, that suggests, you know, EHS is a real phenomenon. It has some real physiology behind it, and, and it involves both the sensitivity of, of the BGCCs to activation, uh, but also uh, the downstream effects in all likelihood of the VGCCs in producing things like neural sensitization. So, um, okay, so now, uh, how are we doing for time? Huh? Okay, we're doing fine, eh? Okay, fine. Um, now, let me just say, you know, I've been talking about these things for about, uh, I don't know, about eight months, maybe a little longer than that. Um, there are several things that concern me about this whole phenomenon um, that I think, when taken together, uh, lead us to uh, really quite drastic concern uh, for our our uh, you know our whole situation here with these with these EMFs and so what I want to do is talk about five things which I've labeled worst case scenarios I think all of these are quite plausible uh, and if they come to pass the combination of even two or three of these uh, will have undoubtedly have absolutely drastic effects on our species. Um, and uh, le let me just say before I get into those, you know, we are in a situation where we're seeing, again, ever-increasing exposures, okay? Uh, we know from things that I haven't discussed that uh, when you have exposure to a particular level of a particular EMF over longer time periods, the effects get more and more severe over time. And that's been shown both in animal studies and in humans, okay? So, um, now we don't have a lot of studies of that type, but the ones that we have are really, I think, quite convincing that that is the case. But we're looking at ever-increasing exposures, and we don't have the foggiest idea what that's going to do, except it's going to be really bad. And um, so, uh, one, one issue, and there are 10 uh, groups, 10 research groups, who've argued that the autism epidemic is probably caused to a great extent by EMF exposures. Okay, and, um, and, uh, and I discussed uh, last year uh, at the uh, Autism One meeting in Chicago um, some, uh, some uh, mode of action which I think can explain autism. And uh, let me just say, before going into that, I want to say we know that excessive activity of the BGCCs can cause autism. We know that from rare mutations. We also know that elevated activity of the main L-type BGCC in the brain uh, has a role in causing autism in the broader autism population. And that's because there's a polymorphism in that gene which is associated with increased incidence of autism, okay? And so that, that particular form of the gene produces more of the protein, of the VGCC protein, and, and it, and it uh, has a higher, and those people have a higher incidence of autism. So, um, so, that, so that process can go on, 
And if you look at this sequence on the left side of this thing, where you have uh, uh, a microwave and lower frequency EMFs activating the BGCCs, increasing intracellular calcium, and then coming back and impacting synapse formation. That sequence of events um, has been supported by 32 different types of evidence arguing that these things occur and that they have roles in autism, okay? And I obviously don't have time to talk about this. It took me an hour to talk about it in Chicago last year. Um, but among the things which are affected are actually five different processes, I only have four listed here, that influence the formation and the function of the synapses, okay? So there is very good reason to know that autism, that the problem in autism has to do with the synapse formation and function in these, in these, uh, in these young children that then uh, leads to, to further changes in the synapses as they grow older, okay? Um, and so the synapses, which of course are the ways through which, you know, one neuron speaks to another, uh, are dysfunctional. All of these processes are regulated by calcium. All of them can be disrupted by excessive calcium. They can also be disrupted by inadequate calcium they, uh, and, and by inappropriate levels of calcium. So I think that's the main mechanism of the autism epidemic. Um, but there are also chemical effects going through calcium. And you can see that over there. And I've already discussed the NMDA receptors and, the, and, the, and the, their role in responding to, uh, to chemicals. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, we may well be in a situation. You know, the last figure in the U.S. for uh, autism was... Uh, about um, one birth in 68. That was for people born in 2002. Here we are in 2016, and with ever-increasing autism, with ever-increasing exposures, we don't have the foggiest idea what the figure is going to be. It could be easily one in 20, one in 10, even one in five. It might be reasonable estimates. So... This could be an absolutely horrendous situation already. It's just we don't know it yet. Um, now, let's go on. Um, now, the neuropsychiatric effects uh, I've told you about, but I haven't really shown you what they are. Uh, these are the main ones. Um, and these occur, you know, these have been shown to occur in response to uh, uh, many different types of, uh, of uh, EMF exposures. And, uh, and these are, you know, becoming more and more common in the population. Uh, and, and so uh, I think these are already extremely common problems uh, in, in, our, in our societies and in, in much of the world. Um, so, uh, you know, this is... Now, th these aren't the only things that have been reported. These are the ones that have been reported uh, repeatedly and I think are, 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 are established uh, effects. Uh, but there, uh, there are many others that have been reported less frequently that I don't think can be considered established, but still are likely, some of these are likely to occur. So, so the, the grand total of things are, are probably goes well beyond this list, okay? And uh, uh, I mean, uh, so uh, worst case scenario number three, uh, sterility, spontaneous abortion, uh, reproduction goes to zero. Well, maybe not quite all the way to zero, but pretty close. Um, I, talked to, I talked to you a bit b before about male and female infertility being caused and, and also spontaneous abortion. Uh, Magras and Zenos, a couple of pe uh, researchers in, in Greece, published a paper now almost 19 years ago, never been repeated, uh, that shows that pairs of mice made it at two exposure levels in what's called an antenna park. So this is a, a series of broadcasting antennas uh, where you have... Uh, now, the, 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 the levels, the exposure levels at ground level were all well within our current safety standards. So certain current safety standards say nothing should happen, there shouldn't be any problem, okay? Um, what they found was that at the higher... And so they put these, they had these in little cages, and they put them, um, uh, they... Uh, 
he exposed them at, at two, two areas, one with a somewhat higher level of exposure, some with a somewhat lower level. Uh, mice go through gestation in about a month. So they can produce a litter in a month and then mate again and produce another little litter, uh, you know, five or six weeks later and so forth. Um, so what happened at the higher level exposure, they went through two successful pregnancies, produced, pr they produced litters, and then they were completely sterile. Absolutely nothing. Uh, at the lower level, it took it took about four and a half months, and then they were completely sterile. So, um, you know, I find it amazing that this has never been repeated. Um, and uh, I think that this is, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean th this was a, um, a huge, um, uh, you know, a warning signal, I think, and uh, and yet, it, so so it's it's quite possible that we will we will have plummeting fertility uh, drops of maybe sixty, eighty, ninety percent, uh, and uh, you know what happens when we don't have another another generation? You know, I mean, this is basically what we're saying, and um, okay, worst case scenario number four, germline mutations. Okay, so we know microwave fields are genotoxic. They produce widespread DNA damage in cells. We know the germlines are heavily impacted by these EMFs. So the germlines, of course, are the ones that produce, you know, that pass the, the, our genomes to the next generation. Um, uh, so the germline cells are heavily impacted. We know that uh, in, there are three studies which studied mutations in the germline and have, uh, have shown that there are increases in these uh, after exposure, uh, mutational increases after exposure, and I've got the citations here. And so we could well be destroying our genomes. And, uh, and, 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 but in any case, we are almost certainly going to be, you know, passing on a larger number of mutations uh, to future generations. And let me just say, when you look at the autism situation, that also has a role in autism. Uh, there is a substantial role of what are called de novo mutations, mutations that are found in the autism patients that were not present in either of their parents. Um, and what that says about autism is that the EMFs in the previous, in, their par in the parental EMF exposures may have important roles, <laughs> as well as the exposures during uh, pregnancy and, and after birth. Of, of, of the child. So, um, you know, so, so um, you know, things get, things get more and more complex and more and more worrisome. And uh, so worst case scenario number, se number five is an epidemic of premature Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we are seeing an unexplained epidemic of premature Alzheimer's and early onset dementias. We know that, number one, uh, early onset neurodegenerative diseases are, are becoming more and more common. Uh, and this, uh, let me say, I have this reference. There's a new study that came out just a few weeks ago uh, that showed even more clearly that this is true, uh, particularly in the U.S. And uh, there are epidemiological studies that have shown that occupational exposures to extremely low frequency EMFs, such as from our power lines, increase Alzheimer's incidence. And those, is, of course, as I've already mentioned, they also work by the VGCCs, okay? So, um, so that, that suggests that VGCC activation can lead to increased Alzheimer's. Um, high levels of calcium, intracellular calcium, have very important roles, uh, both in, in Alzheimer's and also in the other uh, neurodegenerative diseases as well, okay? So, um, so uh, and... Uh, and their higher, higher uh, VGCC activity, so this is the same polymorphism that I told you about before, uh, per, um, is associated with increased incidence of autism, okay? So now, um, you say, well, okay, all of those suggest things, but they're not quite a red flag. Well, maybe they... Um, now there's a fascinating uh, study that was, came out of China um, that was published by Zhang et al., where they showed that young rats exposed to multiple short pulses of microwave EMFs developed as middle-aged rats 
oxidative stress, high levels of the amyloid beta, the, the A-beta protein, okay, so the A-beta protein is characteristic of Alzheimer's, is known to have an important causal role in Alzheimer's, and here that's highly elevated. Um, and they also have cognitive memory impairment. And these are in, is middle-aged rats. So and the rats are not, are not a species known to have Alzheimer's in the past. And here they're coming down with something that looks very much like Alzheimer's disease simply because they're exposed to a series of pulse microwave fields as young rats. Okay. Um, so, you know, and one of the things that I think, and that was published in this, in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this study. Here, I give you the citation here. Um, now, Alzheimer's typically has a very long latency period, uh, and so you know, typically, if you have a stressor like uh, head trauma, for instance, which tends to cause increased Alzheimer's, the actually Alzheimer's actually develops 25 or 30 years later. Okay? So it takes a long time for this whole thing to develop. So it may well be if, that we're looking at the effects of EMFs that occurred 25 years ago, not the effects of EMFs now, which of course are vastly, vastly higher. If that's true, and I don't know that it's true, I hope to hell it's not true, um, that we may be seeing, if we stop all exposures tomorrow, we may be seeing an epidemic that may be coming on from these earlier exposures over the next 25 years that may show, have produced an absolutely gigantic increase in early onset dementias, okay? Now we're seeing, let me say, we're seeing dementias coming in now, they're still rare, at people of age 30, absolutely unheard of before, okay? So there may be an absolutely gigantic increase. Now, I don't know that that's the case, I hope it isn't. But you get some idea of the fact that we're just ignoring things that have absolutely horrendous possible proportions all through, through, um, through uh, very plausible mechanisms. Okay, so, you know, so, so what we're looking at here, well, let me go back. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, I mean, you know, look, 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 at, this, look at this scenario. If, if all five of these things occur, what happens? You have this dramatic decline in reproduction. Among the few people who were born, many of them have, have uh, autism. Probably all of them have ADHD, which kind of is, is more common than autism. Um, of, those, uh, prob of, of, of those tiny number, perhaps, that don't, you may have... Um, uh, many of them are going to develop neuropsychiatric diseases because we're seeing that already all over the place, um, and, uh, and 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 so and, and many of them then uh, may develop very early onset dementias. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I guess I'm kind of speechless when I think about this. Um, it's uh, now. I mean, you know, there's no guarantee, of course, that all those things are going to happen. But they may happen. They are all plausible. And even if only two or three of those happen, we're in very, very deep trouble. Um, I think the neuropsychiatric s stuff is already happening, and we see it all the time, and I don't think there should be any question about that one. So anyway, what do we need to do? Um, I mean, we need basically, I mean, we, we absolutely need to move rapidly in this area. Um, and... Uh, in the U.S., I think we need to repeal the 1996 Telecommunications Act. I don't know whether you have anything equivalent here in Sweden. Um, but uh, we need to stop these ever-increasing levels of exposures. We, there are many, many ways in which these devices can be made much safer. But we're currently running as fast as we can in exactly the wrong direction. Um, we need biologically relevant safety standards. And I've discussed these. Uh, in, a, in a number of different situations, including at the Parliament earlier today. Um, there are ways to develop these, but currently there's no action to actually develop them. Um, 
and and uh, I think cell cu cells and culture could be used to look at the VGCC activation in response to various fields, and this could be done quite easily. Uh, there may be other ways to do biologically relevant safety test standards as well to do uh, the testing, and so so that's kind of where we are. And uh, I thank you. Good night. Good night.